pleasure to welcome Jonas Peters uh, from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Jonas has very kindly agreed to uh, give an extra eight hour uh, mini course on top of the 50 minutes uh, seminar that we invited it uh, originally for. And uh, it's great, Jonas is a, a great lecturer. He's, uh, he's given courses uh, at uh, uh, Christian Learning Summer School in Tübingen. Uh, Jonas got his uh, not sure where he got his PhD. He has three advisors, uh, uh, Bernard Sholkov, uh, Dominique Jansing, and Peter Kuhnman. I think he ended at uh, ETH because he got a medal from the ETH for uh, best thesis. Uh, then he went on uh, for a short time to be leading the Kazali group at uh, Tübingen. And, uh, and then uh, now he's, uh, uh, um, I guess, an associate professor at uh, the University of Copenhagen. I'm going to take more of his time and uh, I'd let you enjoy the lectures. Thanks, Philippe. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm uh, super glad to be here. Uh, I already said this. It's a bit of a funny coincidence that I'm back because uh, I was the last time I was in Boston was actually in 2001. This was uh, after 9/11, and I visited my brother who was studying here. Uh, and uh, for me, it was the first New Year's in Boston, so I brought a lot of fireworks because I thought this should be a good uh, thing to celebrate. But then it turned out that there are no uh, fireworks allowed in uh, public. So I ended up uh, bringing all the fireworks back to Germany, but I forgot uh, to take them out of my hand luggage. So I discovered this at the gate, actually. <laughs> so no one found the fireworks, and my sister freaked out. So we ended up uh, dumping them in a bit of a trash can. I'm glad that uh, nobody, nobody found this, because otherwise I would probably not be here today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this mini course, I, I will talk about causality. And for me, I'm very glad to see so many people um, I'm a bit unsure about uh, your background. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to introduce you to some of the concepts of causality. And I'm trying to keep it basic. Um, if it's going too slowly or uh, too quickly, please do interrupt me at any time. So if you don't understand anything, it's most likely because of me, not uh, because of you. So please do interrupt. Um, OK, I, will, I, I have a couple of uh, slides that I uh, prepared. But again, I'm a bit flexible. So um, if you want to hear more about one uh, of the specific topics, also please come to talk to me in the break or afterwards. And uh, maybe we can adjust even a bit. So I will talk about many things. And this is a very incomplete list of people who contributed ideas uh, to this talk. So I just uh, go over a couple of them. Judea Pearl is um, one of the. Uh, early figures in this field, um, he said UCLA received the Turing Award for his work on causality and graphical models. Um, there's a bunch of people at uh, CMU working on this topic for some historical reasons. They are all in the philosophy department, although they are pretty strong in mathematics as well. Um, we have Donald Rubin and Jamie Robbins at Harvard. Uh, I personally was working with uh, Peter Böhmer and Nikolai Meinshausen at ETH Zurich and <coughs> Dominic Janssing and Bernard Schulkopf at the MTI. Joris Moy contributed a lot uh, to the ideas here. The he's now at the University of Amsterdam, Patrick Hoyer. There are many, many others. Uh, so please do not uh, feel offended <coughs> if I forgot your name here. OK, so um, what I will do is uh, I will try to introduce you into the topic in four slides. And if you take back anything from these eight hours uh, or whatever it will be, uh, please let it be the first four slides. They are quite important to me. So they describe uh, the essence problem of, um, of causality. So consider the following problem. So we have data from uh, some uh, genes. So let's say this is some measure of the activity of a certain gene A. And we measure some phenotype at the same time. So think about the flowering time or something. What you see is that there's a dependence. So the more this gene is expressed, so think about the uh, log expression level here, the more um, the gene is active, the more of the phenotype you find. The question is now, um, in statistics, the question you're answering is often a question of prediction. So it says, well, now assume that you, for example, observe that the activity of this gene A lies around 6. What is then the best prediction for the phenotype? And this is a problem that we have studied for many, many years in statistics, and that is well understood. So you have all these prediction techniques here. You can use a linear model if you like. And then you, you, the answer would probably be something like, well, if the activity is around 6, then you expect the phenotype to lie around 15. In causality, however, we are addressing a different problem. And this is very essential to understand. So here we are asking the, the question as follows. So we are saying, well, now what happens if we actively intervene on the system? So here, for example, what happens 
if we delete the gene A. What is our best prediction for the phenotype if we delete the gene A? And this means that we set the activity to zero, let's say. So here. Did you have a stronger laser? It's a little hard to see. I don't know if anybody else is I don't uh, have any other laser, but maybe there's an analog pointer I could use. A long stick or something. <laughs> <laughs> like a finger. <laughs> That's the start, but maybe. <laughs> Okay, so here the question is, what is the best prediction for the phenotype if we delete the gene, so if we set the activity to zero? And this now is a very different question. Why is this the case? So if you want to answer this question, the only thing that you, what you need to, to include is causality, and that's my, my argument here. So in order to answer this question, you have to talk about the causal structure of the underlying problem. And why is this? So I'm trying to uh, show this with these two slides here. Imagine now that there's a different gene B, not gene A, but gene B, and that shows the, a very similar dependence structure. Now what we will see is that depending on the causal structure, the answer to this problem will be different. Okay, so assume that, we will make this more precise later, but assume that the gene A is really causal for the phenotype. So then what do we expect? If we delete the gene A, so we see, set the activity to zero, so you can think about a hammer and you're changing the gene A, so then we expect to see a difference, a change in the phenotype as well. And this is why the best thing so now to predict the phenotype is to say, well, it probably lies around this interval. This is at least intuitively hopefully clear. So if we have a gene A that is causing the phenotype, we delete the gene A, then the phenotype drops down as well. The gene B for, uh, in this case, um, this, works di this example works different, why? So we have the same dependence structure, but now we have a very different causal structure that lead, can lead to a very similar dependence structure here. So assume that the gene B is now not causal for the phenotype, but there's a hidden common cause, so something that we call a confounder, and this is causing both the gene B and the phenotype at the same time. But now what happens? So if we now intervene on gene B, so if we delete the gene B, we again set the activity to zero, then what do we expect the phenotype to do? Well, basically, we expect the phenotype to do what it always does, so it stays in the area that we have observed it. So this means the best prediction for the phenotype is to say, well, it does what it always does. So here, if we put a hammer on gene B and delete it, we don't, see a, we don't expect a change in the phenotype. Yeah? So just, to, just to be very, very clear, you're saying the, it's an intervention, not an observation, right? Yes. So that you're actually deleting gene B activity as opposed to just observing a case and predicting. Yeah, it with exactly. It. That's that's the correct uh, notation that we are going to use. Okay. So the question here is, we want to predict what the system uh, does after an intervention. Yeah. Right, and also there's nothing special about the value of zero, complete deletion. Any active change, how the system will respond to it. Yeah. So gene deletion is only one special case of an intervention that I chose here. And the take home message is really, if you want to answer this question, you have to talk about causality. And I understand that causality is also a um, rather young research topic, I would say, and there are many subtleties that we are going to discuss with causality, and it's fine if you don't want to talk about causality, but then uh, I think it's important to realize that then the best thing you can do to answer this question is to say, I do not know. If you want to give an answer, then you have to talk about causality. Any other questions about this example? Good. So then step number three, what is, uh, what is a causal model? Um, so usually what we are doing in statistics is we are creating a model for some distribution. So let's say you have a data generating process and we want to model the distribution. So you're saying it's a, it's a Gaussian uh, distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance. Now a causal model is something slightly different because if you have a causal model, you want to do several things at the same time. You also want to be able to model a distribution that you observe. So these are the data points that you have seen on the last slide. But at the same time, you want the causal model to be able to say how the system reacts under these interventions. So this is uh, the, the gene deletion that you have seen on the last slide. Then what usually also comes with a causal model is uh, something like a causal graph. This you have already seen as well. So this is something that is very convenient, for example, to get an overview of the causal structure, right? And then something that, um, if time allows, we're also going to discuss a bit are counterfactuals. So this is also that something that comes out of uh, some of these causal models. These are statements like these what-if statements uh, that we will discuss later. If anyone 
uh, wants to sell you a causal model on the street, make sure that these properties are satisfied. Otherwise, it's not a causal model. So here, we want to be able to model the distribution and, most importantly, also the other interventional distributions. And this is what we are going to discuss in this uh, mini course. Then step number four, if you want to start doing research in causality, it's super easy because what you will see is that um, all the concepts are quite basic. Uh, there's, uh, there are lots of open questions, and I guess most of you are smart enough to immediately uh, start uh, doing great research on this. So what are some of the questions that are, are studied in this research field? Um, so one is, how does the causal model actually work? This is also something that we are going to discuss, but there are lots of subtleties um, that people are still thinking about. Something which is very important also for practical applications is uh, things get more complicated if you have a lot of hidden variables involved um, or feedback. Another question is the question about graphical representations. So in this mini course, we will mostly talk about uh, so-called DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. So we do not assume feedbacks and we do not allow for hidden variables mostly. Um, but if you want to, then these gra graphical representations become rather complicated. So these are these mags and pegs that you have, may have heard of, for example. Counterfactual statements, something that people um, investigate is, is it actually possible to test counterfactual statements in, in practice? And then a very important question that uh, we are, have been also studying a lot is um, in practice often we are not given the graph, but we are rather, rather giving da given data. And the question is, can we somehow infer the graphical structure or the causal structure from the data? Something that uh, is the last question here um, that I think is a very interesting research topic, but that's uh, still in its infancy, so to say. This is the question whether causality is useful in classical machine learning or um, statistical problems. And the reasoning is as follows. So usually you would say that causality becomes important whenever you are interested in answering these interventional questions. But now, then you would say, well, on a first order approximation, if you're not interested in interventions, you don't care about causality so much. But whenever you have systems that evolve over time, so that are not stationary, so you can think about problems like domain adaptation or transfer learning. Then the question arises whether these uh, uh, causality uh, point of views, whether they can help to make the system, the statistical system, more efficient in terms of making use of the data. And this is something that we are beginning to investigate as well. Okay? So these are the four steps into causality. Any questions? Yeah. Discover the causality, that's the one question maybe. And what is the computational complexity in actually uncovering the causal structure? Okay, okay. so the question I repeat is uh, how many data points are needed to uh, recover the causal structure? Um, and what is the computational complexity of the methods? So this is something um, that is, of course, a very difficult question to answer. So uh, what is causal discovery? So that you're referring to this question here. So we are given some sample from the joint distribution, and we are trying to recover the causal model. And of course, this, uh, um, this question now, I would say, is not well posed yet, because what, you're, what we are going to see is that this step backwards, so recovering the causal model from the distribution, um, or from the from a sample from the distribution, this is only possible under further assumptions. And this you can think of, there's an analog actually in statistical learning theory. Um, so it's very similar in statistics because there you also have that if you're receiving data from an underlying distribution, then to recover the underlying distribution is only uh, possible under smoothness assumptions, for example. So if you think about a regression problem, uh, if you don't make assumptions about the smoothness of the uh, function that you're trying to learn, then of course uh, you will also not be able to, to learn the function. So this certainly has to, to play a role in there. And then the, que the second question that I think we should discuss as well is like, do the assumptions that we make in order to um, get this link from the distribution to the causal model, do they, do they hold in practice? So these are the questions we maybe have to answer first, and then I can point you to some results that uh, look at statistical efficiency. Yeah. One thing it might be encapsulated in some of this is the question is what data would be most useful in order to infer? What data would be most useful in order to infer the, the causal structure? Exactly. Um, okay, so this, this all goes to the, 
sort of the, uh, the second part of this, uh, this mini course, again, it's the, uh, the question about inferring the causal structure. So a short answer, so maybe what I should say at the beginning is that this research field is uh, still rather young and I will present to you some ideas how to do this step. How can we learn causal, causal models? And what I would say at the moment, what I think is most promising is if you have actually a, a system uh, that evolves a bit over time that changes. So we call these different environments. So it is possible under some assumptions to learn the causal structure from just observational data. Um, and I can show you some uh, of these ideas and they have some promising results in real data, but it's a very difficult problem. I think you gain a lot if you, some, if you somehow have a perturbation of the system and you don't even need to specify how the system was perturbed. But I think this helps a lot for learning the causal structure. The second point is, the second answer maybe is uh, that a time series structure also helps a lot. Because whenever you have a time series structure in, the, in your system, you at least know that time probably is not, uh, the causal errors are probably not going to point backwards. So if you have a measuring system that measures like one step at a time, at least then you can sure if you find causal errors, they should always point um, forwards in time. This also helps. Okay, um, so these are the three parts that I, I would like to discuss. So how does the model work? So we need to introduce a bit of a language. Okay, thanks. So we need, a bit, we need to introduce a bit of the language and then we are discussing these questions that you were referring to. Can we infer the causal graph structure? And then at, at the last point, I would like to discuss these uh, machine learning questions. Good. If, if there's anything else that you would like to talk about, again, please approach me in the break. This is one, one picture that I would like to show you as well. Um, so what you see here on the bottom, see whether this is stronger, a bit, huh? <laughs> okay, I still use the analog pointer maybe. So what you see here is the, uh, on the bottom, is sort of a classical statistical setting. So what you do first in Statistic 101, I guess, or probability theory, you start with a probabilistic model, and then you are, um, do what we would call probabilistic reasoning. So you're saying, well, if I get a, a sample, uh, what is the distribution of the mean, for example, if I have 50 data points? Then statistics or statistical learning now goes in the other direction. So there you would say, well, if there is an underlying probabilistic model that I do not know, but that I want to infer, how do I do it? So I get some observations, and then I want to infer something. I want to estimate a parameter, for example. I want to infer some property of my underlying probabilistic model. In causality now, things are slightly different. Why? You can do sort of a, a similar uh, graph here. So you can say, well, we have a causal model. And now the causal reasoning would be to say, well, we don't only make statements about observations, but we also make statements about uh, changes and interventions. Now, if you want to go back, this is something that we discussed. We, would, we usually call causal learning or causal discovery, or some people would call it structure learning. So we are given some data, and what we want to infer something about the causal structure. So we are going backwards. So it looks like there's a, a correspondence to the usual statistical world. But there's one crucial difference, and this is as follows. Usually in statistics, if you are given an infinite amount of uh, data points, you are done. So if you are interested in a, in a parameter, let's say the mean, and someone gives you an infinite amount of data points, you just read it off. So if you are given the full distribution, you don't have to do anything anymore. And this is different in causality, because in this step, even we will see this, even if you have an infinite amount of data points, this step be, does not become trivial. So even if you have an infinitely many data, it's still a question about what is the underlying causal structure. And you have seen the, the example at the beginning with the data points with the genes. It's not a question of like how many data points you see. I can give you as many data points as you like. Both of these distributions could have been produced by two different causal structures, which mean that they would make very different sort of statements about what happens under interventions. And in this uh, mini course, mostly due to time, I will, like it, mo for most of the time, I will not talk about a finite, uh, finite sample setting, but I will show you sort of the ideas. I will, in many cases, I will just discuss, well, what happens if you have uh, knowledge about the full distribution? And then, of course, you have the full statistical machinery you have on top of this. Does this make sense? Yeah. For observation, do you, are you thinking about like time series here, or just? Um, this doesn't matter. So this is more general. This can have a time structure or not. 
is actually, so I will, the causal models I will introduce are not regarding time, but this is, you can write them down immediately, I think, um, by yourself. There's, n there's no um, conceptual difference to including time. Good. So I will start with a couple of examples. Uh, some of you may have uh, you have, may have seen before. This is by now a classical one, but it's still one of my favorites. So this is a study from 2012. And what you see here is the chocolate consumption in kilogram per year per person for different countries. And then on the y-axis, you see the number of Nobel Prize winners uh, per 10 million. And there's a very strong correlation. And uh, what you see here, what I think is nice is that sort of Sweden is an outlier. This should make you suspicious. And uh, the, the other one uh, that I think is interesting is that uh, the Swiss chocolate seems to be much better than the German chocolate. And at least it tastes better as well. But here, of course, I mean, the question is, well, this is a dependent structure. What's the causal structure? And you may have seen these examples before. It's quite funny to see that uh, immediately you get like uh, statements like eating chocolate produces Nobel Prize winners uh, studies. This is from confectionarynews.com. <laughs> Maybe uh, should be taken with a grind of salt. Uh, but this is, of course, the reason why I brought chocolate for Philip as well. So we can try, we can do the experiment and see whether it really helps. <laughs> you, you find the, the other uh, direction you find as well. So here on Forbes, they say chocolate uh, and Nobel Prize in studies. So they say geniuses are more likely to eat lots of chocolate, uh, which is uh, claiming the other causal direction, which, of course, is uh, probably false either. But we will have a look at the data set later. This is a data set uh, that I think is very important for historical reasons. So this is a paper from 1950 about smoking and lung cancer. It's a very well done study. I recommend uh, looking at this paper. So where they found the dependence between smoking and lung cancer. And uh, this is uh, some data that you see. Um, the details here are not important, but the most important thing is that the more cigarettes you smoke, the higher the, the chance of lung cancer get. It's pretty impressive how many cigarettes some people smoke. So this is more than half a million. So it used to be very popular. But then here, of course, the question is, um, well, relatively soon after the study also, the politicians said, well, there's a causal link between smoking and lung cancer. And here you really do have the same problem, right? Because this study doesn't show it. So here they said, well, smoking is causing lung cancer, so we should introduce a, a tobacco tax um, in order to reduce the lung cancer. But the tobacco industry, of course, said, no, no, no. So there's a dependent structure, but it may be due to a hidden common cause that we have not measured. And this was for historical reasons. This was a super important example. And it's really qu the question, how well, how do you find out whether there's a causal link or not? We'll look at this example as well. There's another study um, that was a nature publication. So here, what you would find is there are these, I don't know what you call them in, in uh, English. So some children apparently um, are afraid in the darkness. So what you do is you put some light bulbs into the plug, and then it's like almost daylight in the, in the room. And the study found that whenever you have these night lights, um, then you are more likely to develop, as a kid, you're more likely to develop myopia, so short-sightedness. -sight so here, the more light you have, the more myopia you get. So now what to do with this study? Of course, the authors didn't want to claim causality, so then they write something like this. Uh, the strength of the association does suggest that the absence of a daily period of darkness during childhood is a potential precipitating factor in the development of myopia. So you, of course, don't mention the word cause, but you write, what is it, a precipitating <laughs> factor. It means the same thing, but you haven't said the C word. OK, so what do you do? What do you do with such a study? Well, if you're a statistician, you can try to analyze uh, this. If you are clever, then you're inventing something like this. So this is a patent, a nightlight with sleep timer. So this is basically something you plug in, and then it's like almost daylight. But then after half an hour, this thing switches off, and it's dark again. And the idea, of course, is, uh, well, this helps, because if I reduce the, the room light, then uh, the chances of uh, obtaining uh, short-sightedness decreases. And this is a causal interpretation of this study. Uh, we will see that this was actually not, not the case, but this is, this is again just looking at the dependence and claiming that it's causal. Here the question is, does the nightlight with, uh, with sleep timer really help? This is an example that we will have a look at. Uh, this is also a very famous one. This is about kidney stones. Um, and how you recover. So this is something that is known under the name of the Simpsons paradox. 
um, and we will resolve this. And hopefully you agree with me after this that this is not so much a paradox, but uh, rather just a question of causal, uh, causal phrasing. So what we have is we have patients with kidney stones, and we have two different treatments, treatment A and treatment B. And these are the recovery rates. So here you see that there were in total 700 patients, and uh, 350 obtained treatment A, 350 obtained treatment B. And what you see is that uh, it looks like treatment B is better than treatment A because the, the recovery rate is, uh, is higher. And now comes the magic. What I'm now showing you is exactly the same data set, but I'm providing you with more information. So that you can, it actually turns out you can uh, classify the kidney stones into small stones and large stones. And I now show you the results on this, these subcategories. So for small stones, the treatment A was actually better than the treatment B. And for large stones, the same happened. So also there, the treatment A was better than treatment B. So here you can see, look at the numbers. They really do add up. So 87 plus 263 equals 350, I hope. So now, this is known under the Simpsons product. So how can it be? How can it be that in both subcategories, treatment A is better than treatment B, but then overall it looks like treatment B is better? Do you have an intuition for this? How can this happen? Exactly. So the answer is somehow it's an unfair comparison because treatment A had to deal with many more of the large stones. And the large stones, what you can see here, the large stones are the more difficult cases. So here the recovery rates are smaller than for the sm uh, small stones. So these are the difficult cases. And it's a bit unfair because treatment A got assigned to ma many more of the, uh, the difficult cases. And indeed it was the case that in this study the doctors or the medical doctors already thought that probably treatment A works better, so whenever they had a patient coming in with large stones, they felt pity and said, well, you probably get treatment A. And so in terms of causality, this is not so difficult to, to write down. So here, this is the causal structure. So we have the recovery, and the, it's indeed influenced by the treatment, but we have a confounding factor, which is the size of the stone. The question is, we are interested in this, this causal link here, right? And this is something that we are going to compute. So here, what is the expected recovery, for example, if all get treatment B? So this would be an intervention. <laughs> it's still a bit uh, astonishing to me. So I uh, talked about this example once in a class in uh, uh, Tübingen. And uh, during the break, uh, one of the students left. And the next week, he came back and asked what I'm going to talk about like the following week. And I was wondering, what do you mean? And it turned out he felt stomach ache during this lecture. And he had kidney stones, I'm not kidding. So he went like in the break of his lecture, he went to the hospital and uh, had, was diagnosed kidney stones and he got treatment A. So I hope that <laughs> no one of you today is uh, leaving the class. Very weird coincidence. Okay, this is a very famous example. Something that goes into the direction of uh, these applications to machine learning. Uh, so this is uh, an example, an advertisement. Um, so if you are using Adblock as uh, I do, I suggest to switch it off for at least an hour. As browsing the web is a very different experience then. <laughs> so here, this is if you use Google and uh, type in something like buy coffee beans, uh, then what you find is above the search result, this is the first uh, search result, you find all these ads. And these are called the mainline ads. Uh, they are the, the ones that make the most money. Um, so here you see the small AD indicating uh, that uh, this is an advertisement and you can buy something like the kicking horse that I would be curious what kind of coffee this is. But this is a machine learning system, so it's mostly nowadays, it's mo mostly uh, trained with data. Um, so you have data from a lot of customers, you know, uh, after, um, after they have searched for something, what did they click on? And I would want to argue that it's also beneficial to at least think about causality in this concept. Why? So this is a very simplified uh, uh, picture of this, uh, this underlying causal structure. So what you have something is the user intention. So whether the user is looking for some information or wants to buy something, and this is something that is hopefully hidden. Then you have a lot of user data, especially if you're using Gmail or something. So they know, of course, where you're from. They know, like, uh, they know anyhow your IP address, they know the time of the day and so on, and the search query, what you were looking for. And then you have a parameter that is called the mainline reserve. And this determines how many of these mainline ads you want to show. So it's between zero and four. 
And then you have something that is uh, the number of ads in the main line. There are some other factors going in there as well. And then at the end, you have uh, whether the person clicks on the ad or not. So this is a system that, uh, very simplified, of course, but that is underlying this machinery. And what I want to, want to argue later, that you can actually benefit from uh, uh, looking at this causal structure. So here, the, the research question, of course, is, well, this is the parameter that we can tweak. Like if you're Google, for example, this is the parameter that you can change. And the question is, well, how do we choose an optimal mainline reserve given all the other stuff that I have? And this is also something that uh, you know, for example, from reinforcement learning, maybe. Uh, so something that you have seen before. But so this is also something you can phrase in a causal way. Last example, and then we will start doing some real stuff. Uh, so this is, is some data that we have been working with. Uh, so this is, these are gene interactions. So this is a, a data set from yeast. So what do we have? We have about 6,000 genes, and we measure their activity. And uh, we have 160 what they call wild types. I'm not a biologist, but these you can consider as being observational data. And then what is nice about this data set is that you have a lot of gene deletions as well. So you have about 1,500 uh, of those gene deletions where the target is known. So for example, the first data point here means I have deleted on gene number 5,304. And then I measure all of these genes. In fact, the biologists have even repeated the experiment five times, but they only provided us with a mean. So you even have some uh, statistical um, uh, confidence here. So now here, for example, you see one example for the observational data points. So here you see uh, two genes, uh, 5,954 and 4,710. And you see that there's a, um, a dependence between those, those two. And here what you see is these are now all these 1,500 uh, gene deletions. So this is the, if you like, a lot of interventional data. And the goal is to sort of predict causal interactions between these genes. So we are given the data, and we want to see, well, can we predict that, let's say, gene 17 is causing uh, gene number 120? And something that we will make use of, and this is uh, something that may be interesting to see directly from the picture, so somehow these, these causal models, they have a stability guarantee. And what do I mean by this? So if you find a causal model, then what often happens, if you intervene somewhere in the system, except for the target, then often this dependence remains the same. And here you see this, uh, this observation. So indeed, uh, I chose the gene such that this gene is really causal for this gene. And what you find is that the dependence, it's a, if you model it with a linear model, for example, it does not change if you intervene somewhere else in the system. And this is something that is a very interesting property of uh, causal structures as well. But so we will use this data set mainly as really trying to infer some of these causal relationships. Would that be true? by a downstream of one other gene that's causing both of them. They would, and that other gene is doing whatever it does. Yeah, but if you have something like this, so you have these two genes, let's say x and y. And then, indeed, if you now intervene on, on W, you can tweak the example such that the dependent structure remains the same. But now imagine you intervene on this guy then suddenly it's not stable anymore, right? But the points there, uh, maybe I didn't understand. The points that you're showing there are all these uh, perturbations combined? Or are you talking about in each deletion? No, you're, you're right. So these are, these are 1,500 different deletions. These oh. are very different dimensions, yeah. Right. So that one point would, might correspond to a one outlier in that graph, but <laughs> right? The, the deletion of Z. You're right. We'll yeah, but it's, it's very unlikely that even if you intervene on this guy, that the dependent structure remains the same. I mean, I said you can tweak it such that, but usually you don't expect this. Because imagine that you have some variance that comes from a, um, from a different angle here, from a different part. And then if this suddenly becomes very large, then suddenly the dependent structure here is much stronger, right? Because this, this part, if this doesn't change, then these become much more dependent. Because then if this is very large, and this, this component is very large here, then the other component from, the, uh, from V that is independent of X doesn't matter anymore. So what you, what you would get, so this, I mean, taking a bit uh, early maybe, but what you would find is that if you now look at the model where you sort of condition Y on Z and V, 
then it really doesn't matter at all where you intervene. So the conditional distribution of y given its parents, and this is what I mean by a causal model, this will really be the stable no matter where you intervene. It doesn't matter. Whereas if you are not, like if you are not uh, sort of uh, shielding off by using the parents, then you won't get the stability. Good. That's the last uh, motivating example. And now I'd like to, uh, if there are no further questions, I would like to talk a bit about how do you do it. Good. So what are, what are causal models? So this is the first part, causal language and causal reasoning. Uh, so how are these causal models built? And there are a couple of ways to do it. And I will mostly focus on st so-called structural causal models. And this is the picture you should have in mind. So we are now trying to build a causal model that is really able to do all these parts here. OK, so here you see the first structural causal model. And you will see immediately that it's something very easy. So what is it? It's basically, if you're looking for a structural causal model, and we start with two variables, x and y, and um, a structural causal model is just a collection of two equations. In this case, we will write x as a function of noise and y as a function of x and some noise. So these are sometimes called structural equations. Uh, we use the word structural causal models. Sometimes some people would use structural equation models, basically the same thing. So formally, it's now a set of two equations. And you have these noise variables. And for now, let's assume that these noise variables are independent. As an example, uh, you can think about uh, x being something like the altitude of a location, and y is the average temperature of this location. So we know that uh, if you sort of this is a roughly correct, at least for a certain range, if you go up 100 meters, then roughly the temperature decreases by 0.6 degrees Celsius. Of course, this is only an approximation. It's not uh, going to be a linear effect, and we will see some data later. But let's say it's a linear model for now. So then we are saying, well, x is just some distribution. So you have a distribution of different uh, locations in a country, let's say. And then the average temperature is now a function of this altitude. And again, you have some uh, noise that you model as being independent um, of the altitude, which could be something like some other ge uh, geographic uh, features here. So then formally, so you have the set of equations that we call s. And then you have a distribution of the noise variables. And here we assume they are IID, let's say Gaussian 0, 1. Then you can draw a, um, a corresponding causal graph. And how do you do this? Well, it's trivial. You always check which of the variables appear on the left-hand side. And if they do, then you draw an edge from the variables on the left-hand side to the variable on the right-hand side. Now, first thing we need to check, why does this uh, induce or entail a joint distribution over x and y? So this, hopefully, you see. Uh, what is the corresponding, so if I write down this model, you can now guess maybe. So what is the corresponding distribution over x and y? So I'm telling you, this is a Gaussian 0, 1 distribution. So certainly, x must be a Gaussian 0, 1 distribution. And this is, again, Gaussian 0, 1. So what is the distribution of y, for example? What's the marginal distribution of y? Gaussian, yes. What is the mean? Zero, and what's the variance? 37, exactly. And now, what is the, we have a dependent structure, of course. So what is the covariance here between x and y? I think it's minus 6. Yeah, I heard it correctly. So this, is a, this induces, if you write down a model like this, this induces a, a joint distribution over x and y. So in this case, it's a bivariate Gaussian with a certain mean and a certain covariance structure. So we will see that this holds in general, even if you have more than two random variables. But now comes the important part. How do we model interventions? And this is actually something, something very easy as well. So what you do is you just take one of these equations and replace it by something else. So if this is a very hypothetical intervention in this case, but if you take your city and put it to a, like raise it up, so you, I don't know. They did something similar in Seattle, I think, no? They, where they just raised it up by or was it 10 meters or something? So you take the same city, and then you rise it by, let's say, 300 meters by building a giant wall. Then what, what happens is that you are sort of replacing this. This is the mathematical expression for this. You're replacing this structural assignment by another one. And then what you see is that this is a now 
is sort of you're starting from the same structure causal model, but this, of course, induces a new distribution. And what is it? Well, in this case, we certainly have x we just put to 3. This is what we call an intervention. So x is always 3 now. So the probability of x being 3 is 1. And what happens to y in this case? Well, the distribution of y now changes. Because now, when, if you have that x is always 3, well, then the mean of y is minus 18, and the variance is 1. Right? So this is the mathematic formalization of an intervention here. Yeah? So how intervention differs from just conditional? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> I come back to this many times. And uh, on the next slide, maybe it's, it becomes clearer. This is another intervention. So what you can also do is you can intervene on the temperature. So now we are saying, well, we don't care about the altitude anymore. What we are doing is we are building a, a giant uh, a compartment around the city. And we just say, well, we have a heating, a giant heating machine. And we always set the temperature to 2 degrees Celsius with a variance of 2. So what happens now? So this is another intervention that you can do. And what you will see, and I've already depicted this in the graph, that if you do this, then the altitude and the temperature don't matter anymore, because you have this, this <laughs> giant compartment over the whole city. So therefore, in a, in a sense, x and y now become, uh, become independent. Again, this, this sort of induces or entails the distribution over x and y. And now it looks very different. So the, distri the marginal distribution of x is very important. This did not change. So here we have that the marginal distribution of x is still 0, 1, right, as before. It didn't change. But now the distribution of y equals a Gaussian with mean 2 and variance 2. And what we have done is we have created uh, uh, some independence between x and y. So this is a, a we will see later that this, here you can already guess. So if you don't put in a Gaussian to 2, but if you set y equals to 4, for example, you would have the same thing. You would still have that x and y are independent, whereas if you condition, this is not the case. But we will see this uh, more clearly later. OK, but here, this is I mean, it's a super easy mathematical process of interventions. But this is how we formally do it. Any questions? Yeah. yeah uh, maybe I'm not kind of fully getting the picture here. So what I have is that I have basically a set of samples, like you know, sample x1, y1, x2, y2, x, and y. Now, x and y are basically jointly Gaussian. Now, when they are jointly Gaussian, x is a linear function of y. y is also a linear function of x. So now, I'm looking at the second picture. After getting these n samples of x, i, y, i, how do I draw the arrow between x to y? Because I, I, I can technically write, you know, draw an arrow between x to y. Y c where I can do it from y to x. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do I, how do I find out that this is sort of the error points from x to y, not from y to x? Two questions about this. One, you talked about sample. A sample. This is really about distributions. There's no finite sample involved so far. This is about distributions. It's not about a finite sample. So this is about building a model. What does it mean to be a causal model? So we will talk about samples very soon, but not, not now. The other question is, how do we find out whether it's a linear model from x to y or y, uh, from y to x? This is a very important question, and we will talk about this in the second part about causal inference. Right now, I'm giving this to you. So right now, in the first part, we assume that someone is giving you the correct structural causal model. And of course, we want to relax this, because in practice, this will never happen. But what we have to make sure is that we, have, we are able to co like work with these structural causal models if someone gives it, uh, gives it to you. And then, of course, at the end of the day, we want to infer it from the data ourselves. But this is the first step. So here we assume it's given. I mean, I mean mathematically, like writing y as a function of x or x or y is equivalent. But I think you are saying the notation here is important. The fact that in that equation you're writing x, that, that means that x is the cause of Yes, so the, this is, so you can formally do this. If you, but now we have the language already, no? So if you would write the same model, but now you uh, re replace x and y, so you're writing x as a linear function of y, then you have a model that you, you can, it induces exactly the same observational distribution, but it would induce very different interventional distributions. Because if this is the correct, so I go back one slide, if, if this is the correct cause of structure, then it means that if you intervene on x, you will see a change in y. Whereas if you exchange the roles, then if you would intervene on x, you would not see a change in y. So this means it really does matter how you write it here. How you write it here. And the question, of course, in practice, how do we find it out? This, I have to apologize, we do only do in the second part. But it's important that this makes a difference here.
And right now we assume it's given. Okay, so here um, you can do this for an arbitrary number of, uh, of random uh, variables, of course. So here I just um, drew four. So it's the same idea. You have four random variables, x1 to x4, a structural causal model is just a set of equations and a joint distribution over the noise variables, which are all assumed to be independent. And for now, we assume that uh, the corresponding graph does not have cycles. You can draw the corresponding graph very easily by saying, well, here, x1 appears on the right-hand side uh, for the equation for x2. So we draw a, an edge from x1 to x2. That's just it. Yeah? Sorry. To clarify the, the prior point, that also is implicit in that structure is you cannot have, like it's a directed graph, right? So, so in other words, it, it would be impossible to say, you know, x is a function of y and y is a function of, 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 of x in, in this, but uh, under this structure. The question is, is it, okay, so I repeat the question, is it uh, possible to introduce feedback here? So can we say x1 is a function of x2 and x2 is a function of x1? So um, let, we, we come back to this. So the first question is, and this relates to this, why do you see, why can I always, why does this construction here always induce a joint distribution over x1 to x4? This is the first property that we needed to check, right? We computed it by hand in the bivariate example. But why is this the case here? So, so why do you see this? Why, so why is it the case that whenever I draw a structure like this, I write down these equations and I give you the joint distribution, so I'm telling you again, think about a Gaussian zero one case or something, and I'm telling you the functions here. So I'm saying this is x3 squared plus sinus of n1. Why does this always entail a joint distribution over x1 to x4? Say again? Okay, because there's no cycle, and can you make this more specific? Exactly, you start at the source. So think about a computer program. So think about sampling from this distribution. What you could do is you start at the source variable, in this case x3. You first sample from the noise distribution n3. So let's say it's given, right? Let's say it's a Gaussian 0, 1 distribution. Then you get a data point for x3. We are generating the first data point. And then what you're doing is you, you then go to the next variable. So we now already have the value for x3. So then we can solve this equation. So you sample from n1. And then you already have the data point for x3. So that you plug it through this function, and you get the corresponding value for x1. So this is exactly what you're doing. You start at the source, and then you propagate down. And this relates now to the question. So is there any way of so still, if you now introduce cycles, because this acyclicity we have used for obtaining the source, right? So if you have a cycle, there's no source node. So is it still possible to somewhat write down a distribution that is entailed by this model? And the answer is yes, often it is. Sometimes it's not, but often it is. This is the only thing you have to answer. So if you have cycles, you have to say, what is the distribution that we are talking about? And one solution is what people sometimes look at is something like an equilibrium distribution. So they say, OK, if you now do, the, do this procedure and you let the system evolve over time, does this converge to a stable distribution? And if it does, then this is a well-defined object. But this is really the crucial point here. We somehow need to make sure that our causal model is entailing a joint distribution. Does this answer your question? Yeah. So here, it's just a triangle, triangular system, right? If uh, the f1, f2, f3, f4 were yeah. linear, it, was, it would be a triangular system. So it just needs this to have almost surely a solution. Yeah, exactly. So this is, uh, if you have uh, an acyclicity, it's, uh, everything is easy, yeah? You can, this is also, I mean, this goes now, if you want to prove it, you do it exactly like this. And if you think about generating samples, you think about a computer program, yeah. Yeah? So, it's a, it could be a vague question, but what it takes to convert an SCM into a dynamical system? Uh, not much. You just introduce time. So think about uh, copying this. For example, you, you can model now uh, these as being the instantaneous effects. So this is all at uh, time point t. And then you, for example, could copy this, this uh, whole thing to t plus 1. And then you just draw edges from the variable x4t to x4t plus 1. But you can write down the, exactly the same way. And this is actually also what, what we have done. It's, uh, it's very easy. Yeah. Good. 
So here, just for notations, so the observational distributions we often call p. And the interventional distribution, you can now, exactly as you have seen before, what we are doing now, interventional distribution just replaces one of these structural, uh, structural equations. And this is what we, this is this famous do notation that uh, Judea Pearl introduced. Uh, so this is because it induces a new distribution, and this is the name that we give to this distribution. So we say do x1 equals 0. So this indicates we have started with a certain structural causal model, and then we have replaced the structural equation for x1 by x1 being 0. And I go back one slide, because here what you see now is if you put x1 zero to 0, think about the computer program. Before, x1 was depending on x3, right? But now it doesn't depend on x3 anymore. We just always set it to 0. So what you get is that this arrow here, this edge, disappears. OK, you can do many other interventions as well. So here, you can, for example, intervene on uh, x4 and set it to 13. And then you would call this uh, do x4 equals 13. And now I'm coming back to the question, well, is it the same as conditioning? It's not. And this uh, I would like uh, uh, sort of to make clear here. Think about this system and, and think about these all being linear sort of equations. So x2 is just a linear function of x1 plus some noise or something. And let's say it's a positive linear function. And now I go back to the original STM. Imagine now that we know that x4 is very large. It's like 2045. What does it tell you about x1? It increases the chance that x1 was also large, right? Or maybe x3 was large. But something had to be large. It's pretty unlikely that, uh, that x4 is very large by itself. So if you condition on the fact that x4 was very large, then probably one of these variables or these other variables have been large as well. So he, this propagates, this information propagates sort of up the graph. Whereas if you intervene, so I, now I'm setting again going to the intervened, um, uh, distribution. So then the distributions of these guys don't change. Right? So now we are setting this to 13. This is very different from conditioning. Because the, if, if you think about the computer program, these assignments for the, these three variables, they didn't change. Right? So they, they don't change, so they still have the same distribution. Whereas if we condition, this means, well, probably something was large, so the distribution changes. So this is why the do notation here, the do, and the, the do distribution is very different from the conditional distribution. And this we will see a couple of times. Yeah? Consider assignments that are the form of constant? Uh, no. So the question is, do we always have to um, uh, consider assignments that are constant? The answer is no. So actually, the other ones are more informative. Uh, so we will, if you think about randomized experiments, this is just one way of uh, looking at interventions. So there you don't want to set it to 13, but you want to randomize. So you're saying maybe you set it to 13 with a certain variance and a Gaussian variable or something. You can even, so if you think about this advertisement example, we were setting the mainline reserve depending on the user data. Now if we change the mainline reserve, we want to see, well, how does the system perform? How many clicks do I receive if I intervene on the mainline reserve? And of course, it would be stupid to always set it to three, to always show three ads. So there, an intervention is actually even more complicated. So there, an intervention is even a conditional. So you're saying, I still want to condition on, let's say, the user data, but I want to condition in a different way. So this is also something you could do. So here, you could intervene on x2, but still make it dependent on x1, but in a different way. So this is why these interventions are, are quite flexible. Yeah. And you use this in practice as well. Different from the, the, the notation that you have. So uh, what is the distribution that, uh, that we're talking about when you say p? Uh, either, either, either joint distribution or? Yeah, p is a joint distribution over x1, x2, x3, x4. Yeah. OK, so it is, it is a joint distribution of all the variables when one of the variables takes one value. No, a distribution is, if you like, it's just a, a measure, right? So this is just a distribution on r to the 4. So this is just a measure on r to the 4. But the important point is that this is a different distribution now. Right? So if you do not intervene, you get a distribution that we call p. And if you do intervene, you get a different distribution. So here, for example, x4 can take many different values, whereas if I intervene and set it to 13, it always is 13. So therefore, it must be a different distribution. And this is just the notation for this new distribution. If you don't like it, you can call it p tilde. But uh, I'm telling you, it will be convenient later on to call it this way. Yeah. But so far, it's just a name. Maybe like one structural equation at a time? 
No, we can all center in at several equations uh, simultaneously, and it's also a good question because sometimes we will uh, need to do that. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, could you maybe uh, uh, tell us what p sub do x1 equal 13 would be? Uh, it's the same thing. So let's say we start with this structural causal model, and now you intervene on x1 being 13. So you replace this equation here by x1 being 13. And how does the corresponding graph look like? You can probably answer this yourself. So x1 is now always 13. So one of the edges disappears. Yeah, this one, right? Because x1 is always 13. So the corresponding graph would actually be looking like this. Yeah. Um, good. I, I think we do a, a short, short break, and then we look at a concrete example with the, um, with the kidney stones. So just five minute break or so. Okay. Let's continue. Want some water? I have some. Okay. Thanks. Sir. Good. So let's look at then a concrete example. Not the correct one. So this is the, this is the example of uh, the kidney stones. So now, what do we have? So we are interested, as I tried to argue before, we are interested in saying, well, what happens if you, if you set the treatment to, let's say, A? So all get treatment A. So this is an intervention. And the, the point here is now that I'm giving you the causal structure, but I'm not giving you the structural causal model. So I don't know what exactly these functions are and what the noise distributions are. We are just given the observational distribution and the causal structure. In fact, we are given, I'm lying a bit, because we are given a, a finite amount of data, but let's say uh, this is very close to the observational distribution, because I want to not focus on the statistics part here. So then what do we do? So the question is, can we now, so we are given data from this, observa from this observational distribution, and can we somehow infer something about this interventional distribution where we in infer the treatment? And the answer is, yes, we can. And there's something that uh, leads, uh, uh, to, this, to the answer that is, uh, I think, a very nice tautology. So here, again, we want to compute the distribution for the intervention do treatment being A. Okay, so this is what we are interested in, but we have data from the wrong distribution. So now, this is a, a mute, what I call mute, the most useful tautology ever. So how does it read? If you intervene only on XJ, you intervene only on XJ. So this is clearly in uh, tautology, but why does it help? So look at this example here. This is the observational distribution where we have the data from. So the size of the stone is causing treatment and recovery. And we have an interventional distribution where we set the treatment to A. Interested in this distribution, so for example, you're interested in the question, what is the probability of recovery under this do intervention? But we only have data from this distribution. And here comes now the tautology into play. What are we doing? We are intervening on the treatment, right? So we are intervening, we are setting the treatment to A. So what this implicitly also means is that we are not changing the way the recovery depends on the size of the stone on the treatment. So here what we are doing is we are intervening on this guy. We are changing the treatment, but this also implicitly means we are not intervening on the recovery. So the structural equation for the recovery remains the same after the intervention. And this now means, you can think about this if you like in a break, this now means that the conditional distribution of recovery given treatment and size, this does not change. And this is written down here. So the distribution of recovery given size and treatment is still the same in the observational distribution and in the interventional distribution. And this is, in a way, this follows from the tautology. But this is a very useful thing. And this we are going to use now. Is this clear, this statement? So this is what we are looking for, and this is what we can use. What is the other conditional that remains the same here? Do you see that? There's one more thing. So I wrote down one, but there's another one. What about the distribution of the treatment? Of course, this changes, right? This is where we intervened. But there's one more conditional that remains the same. Do you see that? Yes, size of the stone. So the marginal distribution of the size of the stone. 
It's exactly the same, right? Because we are not intervening here. So the structural equation for the size of the stone remains the same. And now I would like to ask you to take a pen and paper and see whether you can compute this. So just five minutes. So this is the target. This we want to compute, and this is what you can use. And now see whether you can come up with a strategy. And so this is the one thing that we can use, and I write down the other one. This is P of S equals pre-do treatment A of S. So this doesn't change either. So now what you have to do is you somehow have to massage this bit to make it dependent on, like this is a distribution, right? Think about this as being P tilde. Now you have to massage this a bit so that it only depends on terms that are sort of looking like this and like this, because then you can transfer this to the observational distribution. So do it now. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah? I don't have a pen, so, but you condition on the two size stones, and because they are actually about the same, and the treatments that you tweak close to the average of the two values for the treatment of A, I think. So yes, so the, what's the average here? It's 0 0.83, right? And <laughs> that's even, even the, the right intuition without formulas and without pen, uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, we will see. If, shall I show you how to do it formally? So um, I'm always using the wrong one. So this is how you would do it. So you, this is the thing. I mean, the details here don't matter too much. But this is the thing that we want to compute, right? But we don't have data from this. We have data from the observational distribution, which is not the interventional distribution. And now we are using these, these nice tricks where we are saying, well, some of the things remain the same in both distributions. These are just these conditionals, right? So what you're now doing is you're trying to massage this formula to get something that is exactly look like what you, you suggested. So the first step, for example, is just to say, well, we now marginalize over S. So this we can do, right? And because T is always A, we can also add that t equals a, because this always happens in this distribution in, where we intervened on t and set it to a, right? Now, the next thing is to just define the conditional distribution, uh, look at the definition of a conditional distribution. So what you're saying now, well, this is the joint, and this equals the conditional of r given s and t times s and t, the marginal over s and t. So now the next step is you don't have to copy this, of course. So I can put the slides online if you like. So the next thing is to say, well, get rid of this t equals a again. And then what you have is this is the only important part here. We have an expression that, of course, still like, looks as p do t equals a, so the, the interventional distribution. But now we can use our most useful tautology ever, because this guy here is the same in the observational distribution and in the interventional distribution. So we can replace these the same here. And then what you end up is, is exactly what you suggested. So we are looking at the recovery given that the size of the stone is, let's say, small and large, and tree, treatment is A, and then we multiply by the uh, chance of having a small stone or a large stone. And because these groups were roughly the same, roughly 50%, we just have to take the average over the recoveries of the treatment. So I go back to the data. So this is the recovery. This is the probability of recovering given that you have a small stone and treatment A, this is the probability of recovering given that you have a large stone and treatment A. So then you get something like the average. It should be a tiny bit closer to this guy because this is a tiny bit larger. So this is why you get 0.832. Okay, and you can do the same thing for the treatment B. And what you will see is that, well, if you force the person to get treatment B, then the probability of recovery is 87%. So what does this mean now? This answers our first important question, namely, which of the ones is better? This is exactly what you want to look at if you're, if you're wondering which of the treatments is better, because you cannot just look at the data as it is, because it's messed up by these doctors assigning the treatment A to more difficult cases. So this is the question you're interested in. You want to, so if you, have, if you are a patient and you don't know whether you have like a small stone or a large stone, you just have to decide, do I get treatment A or B? This is exactly what you're looking for. So you want to say, well, what is the probability to recover if I get treatment A? 
if I force myself to get treatment A or treatment B. And here you see now that treatment A is indeed better than treatment B. Uh, treatment B. Yeah? Um, why do you need the causal framework for this? I mean, this is, if you look at the data, it's kind of there's a confounder there, the way the groups were split, and you can... Use very good question. Why do we need the causal framework? A uh, very, uh, very good uh, transition to the next two slides, I hope. Uh, so it turns out, so here, by the way, just as a reminder, because yeah, we have seen this already, this is different from the recovery given treatment A. This I want to stress right, once more, right? Because this means if you're given treatment A, so if you see yourself and you just don't think about interventions, you see yourself being in the study and you, you, you realize, aha, I got treatment A. What is my recovery rate? the probability of recovery. This means, this carries information, right? Because if you got assigned treatment A, this probably means you're a hard case. So this means that the, the recovery rate is lower, right? So this is here, it's a different thing to condition or to intervene. This is once more, you see this all over the place, but this I would like you to take home. So now, why do we need this causal framework? It turns out that this idea holds very in a very general sense. And uh, this is the definition of what co is called an adjustment set. So if you imagine that there's not the size of the stone, but there are like many, many other variables as well, then what we need to do is we need to adjust for them. And we formally we are saying, okay, we are given a structural causal model over x and y and some covariates w. And we are interested in the causal effect from x to y, very similar to what we have seen before. We are interested in saying what happens if like, we treat ourselves with treatment A or B. So here there's the treatment, the x, and the y is the outcome, the recovery rate. And then we are saying, well, this is a valid adjustment set if we can compute this interventional distribution by what is called adjusting for z. So what we are now doing is, and this is sort of the averaging, right? This was the recovery, like for treatment A, and we adjusted for this, for the size of the stone, so we took the average over the size of the stone. You can think about taking averages here. Again, you see this is different from just conditioning y on x. Um, because it would be the same if you would have another z given x here, but it's not. So this is really a different thing. So now the proposition is, for example, if what you, what you want to, ha to have is you want to have such an adjustment set, because then you can do this, what we just did for the example of the kidney stones, in a very general manner. So you're given like, data from the observational distribution, and we can compute like, the interventional distribution from just the observational distribution, right? It's like magic. We don't have to intervene at all. We just can, if you are given the causal structure, we can just read it off. And so this parent adjustment is the easiest form of uh, adjusting. This means that you can always use the causal parents of x for adjustment, adjusting. This is always a valid adjustment set for x, y. OK, so th this is maybe even a bit more interesting. And we will see a more complicated graph in a second. Um, I want to say. One word about adjusting and linear models. Mm. Yeah, how do I do it? So in a way, this is a full distribution, right? And sometimes you want to see the difference between, if you want to talk about causal effects from x to y, for example, it, what you could do is you could always compare. You can always compare p of, let's say, y and p of y where you intervene on x. Right? So you can compare these two things, if you like. So, and if you see that these are very different, then probably x has a strong effect on y. Right? So you intervene on x. And if you see there's a big difference between the, the distribution of y, so if y changes a lot, then you would say there's a strong causal effect from x to y. There's one way of uh, sort of summarizing this. And this is especially interesting in linear models. And how does it work? So if you want to just give one number, then what you can sometimes do is to do the following. So this is sometimes called the causal strength or the causal effect from x to y. So what do you do? How do we define it? We are saying, well, how much does the expectation change? So this is like a one number summary of the difference between these two distributions. So what you're doing is you're taking the expectation. Oops, sorry. You're taking the expectation of y, you are looking at this in this new distribution, do x equals x. And now what we are doing is we are taking the derivative with respect to x. So this is sometimes called the causal effect. And now 
just intuitively this means, I mean, it's the same idea, right? So if you change x a tiny bit and you see a dramatic change in, y, in the expectation of y, you would say, well, there's a very strong effect from x to y, right? So this is sometimes what people use as a sort of a summary of the causal effect. And now this has a very nice uh, sort of property because in linear, if you have linear Gaussian models, so if all these structural equations are linear and Gaussian. What you can do is you can just read this effect off. So think about a graph that looks maybe like this. Y and you have a Z here. And you have now coefficients. Can you read this or is this too loud? Yeah, I don't. Ah, I can even use this graph here. So if you have a, uh, a causal structure that, like this, and now if all of these are linear structural equations in a Gaussian setting, for example, we have a coefficient here, 2, minus 3, 4, 1, 5, 7, minus 7. And now if you are interested in the causal effect from x to y, and now I'm talking about this guy here. So you can read this off from the graph. And how? You just multiply the causal graphs, the causal paths here. So there, in this, in this case, the causal effect from x to y equals 1 times 5, which is 5. And this is, a, in a way, this is intuitive, right? So we have another path here, but this is not really causal. We don't care about this, this path here, right? Because whenever you think about you intervene on x, you're changing x, and you're interested in how much does y change. And here you look at the change in the expectation. So what you see is, well, if you change x a lot, then what really matters for the change in y is this path here. Right? So you multiply 1 and 5. Any guesses if there's a second path? So what do you do if you have this? Yes, then it's minus 2. Because then you add all these paths. These are called, uh, I think, Wright's path rules or something. So this is a small exercise, if you like, to make sure that this is really the case. I mean, I'm just claiming this now. But this is, uh, this is nice, I think, for the intuition. Because in linear causal models, this is what you would expect. No? You are really interested in the causal paths from x to y. And these are, these are not interesting. Yeah? Over there, why are you comparing the marginal distribution of y and not the conditional distribution of y given x to the 2x? You can also do that, but in a way, I think you want to be, yeah, I mean, here, I mean, this is a, here we are not comparing this anyhow, right? We're just looking at the intervention. But there's one thing that you want to maybe, this is now a hand wavy a bit, but if you have a situation like this, you want the conditional, uh, you want the effect from x to y to be zero, right? But the conditional really changes. So if x is large, then y is probably also large. So one has to be a bit careful there. I mean, it's possible. This is not. I'm not saying by any any means that this is optimal. So there are many different ways uh, that one can choose this. So. But now we will come. Uh, we will see like that. This is actually quite useful in the following sense. So these were adjusting uh, adjusting sets, right? So now, how does adjustment come into play? Adjusting. If you now are interested in so, sort of finding this. Finding this effect here, so this we can read off. But if you want to find this in practice, what you can do is you just, if you, are, if you know that z is a valid adjustment set, there's another way of getting this, this number 5, or in this case, minus 2 here. And how does it work? You just do a linear regression. So this is the first way, is sort of looking at this path. And there's an alternative. I can write over there. And this is now very important for practical reasons, because if you have data, this is exactly what you want to do. So the alternative if z is valid adjustment set, and this uh, proposition, for example, tells you one way whether this is the case or not, what you can do is z x to y equals the regression coefficient 
for x in a linear model y you regress y on x and z. Okay, this is the same thing. And this is very useful in practice. So if you know that you can adjust for z, so this is a valid adjustment set, all what you have to do is if you want to find the correct causal like effect from x to y, you just have to include z in a linear model. So let's see, let's look at this in an example. Then hopefully this becomes clearer. So this is now a causal graph that is a bit more complicated. Okay? And we are interested in the causal effect from x to y. So how can we do this? How can we compute this? So one way is to say, well, we're looking first at this, this criterion, what is a valid adjustment set, right? And what was the criterion? So it said that we can always use the parents of x as a valid adjustment set. And why is this intuitively the case? Because you cannot just like condition y on x or just use the regression model from y on x. Why not? Because this, what we call a backdoor path, this messes, messes the, the relation up. Because if you think about the kidney stones example, right? So this was the treatment and this was the recovery, but we could not just condition y on x because we had this weird dependence on the size of the stone, right? And these are the ones you want to adjust for. So if you now, I mean, at least intuitively, what happens is if you now condition on the parents, you sort of block all the backdoor paths. Okay, this is the, at least the intuition. Formally, the proposition tells us, well, if you adjust for the parents, in this case A and C, you are, you are doing fine. So then you are blocking all this, and this happens exactly, right? So you're blocking all these paths that you're not interested in. You're only interested in this, this causal path here, from X to Y. Okay, the parent, parent set is a valid adjustment set, so that's fine. So we can somehow correct for A and still obtain the correct causal coefficient from X to Y. Can you guess whether there are other valid adjustment sets? So somehow, I mean, is it really necessary to adjust for C? Somehow no, right? Because it doesn't really, I mean, A seems important because it blocks this path, but C somewhat doesn't matter. And there's a more general sort of criterion than the parent adjustment. This is the, called the backdoor adjustment. So what you want to do is you really want to block all these backdoor parts. So it's called a backdoor because it enters x through the backdoor, so to say. So we have seen that CA is a valid adjustment set. This is the parent adjustment. But I'm telling you without proof that you can also, for example, use K for adjustment. And you can also use F, C, and K for adjustment. This doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. And now this becomes a bit more interesting, right? Because what happens is that if someone is giving you this sort of causal structure and you obtain data from this structure and you're interested in the causal effect from x to y, you know, aha, I can adjust for a and c. But now imagine you are not observing a. So a is something hidden. A, you have no data about a. So then this theory tells you, aha, you can also adjust for k. So this is especially important if you have a lot of hidden variables and you need to adjust somehow like for this backdoor path, but there's a theory that tells you exactly how to do it. And I just want to show you one example. So maybe that's, that's helpful. I mean, it only takes two minutes. So if you, have, um, uh, if you have now a linear model, you put coefficients on all of these edges. And let's say um, I now generate a data set where I have exactly these coefficients, so this is minus 2 and this is minus 1. And then we can have a look what happens. So what is the causal effect that we would like to recover? It's plus 2, of course, right? It's the product of these path coefficients. But in practice, we don't know that this is minus 2 and minus 1. We just have data. We just have data and want to recover this plus 2. What we are given is data and the causal structure here, the graph structure. So what you would do in practice is as follows. So hopefully this works now. So this is just a very small R program. So what I'm doing is, can you see that? Or is this too small? How do I make this bigger? OK, it doesn't work with like units, whatever. OK, so what do we do here? So we are just generating data from this uh, structurally, like this structure that I just showed you, right? And these are all linear structural equation models, and I just, I mean, I use Gaussian, but of course you can use anything else if you like. So I'm generating 500 data points, and this is how you generate data from the structural equation, right? So you just, you start, as we have seen before, you start at the source node, 
I show you the picture once more. So hopefully C is the source node. Yes, it is. So you start with C, and then probably you want to simulate from A, and then you propagate down, right? Uh, let me see that I did this correctly. So we start with C, then we simulate from A, and then you propagate down. So far, so good. And now we want to recover this causal coefficient from x to y. So we are now just simulating data. So we have our data set, so you can look at this. And for example, simply do something like this. I mean, you find that, I don't know, you have some distribution here, some data. And now the question is, well, what is the, the causal coefficient from x to y? And if you just, I put this up, if this works. If you just regress y on x, this will not do the trick. So then you get, so these are the coefficients that you, go, that you get. If you just regress y on x, the coefficient that you get is 1.3. It's biased. It's not the correct causal coefficient. And why is this? Because you had this weird backdoor path that you're not controlling for, right? Instead, what the parent adjustment says, it, it says, well, you should adjust for the parents A of C, A and C, or what you can also do is you can adjust for K. So what, what this means in practice, you just use a linear model and you're including K. So we are saying do a linear model from Y on X and K. And then you look at the reg regression coefficient of x. And suddenly, now we get an unbiased estimate. So this is much closer to 2. So you can also, as I said, you can also use f, c, and k. So this example is chosen on purpose because I'm a big fan of f, c, cologne, which is a circle team, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so here, x, uh, x is also very close to 2, right? So it's 1.98. So again, if you adjust for these variables, then again, you get an unbiased estimator. But, and this of course is important, you cannot do this for all sets, right? It's not that if you, the more you include, the better. So if you also include H, for example, then again, you get a biased estimate. So then you're not close to two. And this, this sort of the, this theory of adjusting tells you exactly what you can adjust for and what not. Can you remind us where H was and why should be Yes. There? So here, if you, if you adjust for k, that was fine. And intuitively, why? Because we're blocking this path. If you include f, for example, it doesn't matter as well. This is a bit more tricky maybe to see, but you can imagine it doesn't really have an influence on this path, right? If you include h or g, this is a bit more tricky to see, but this you are not allowed to do. Because if you're including g, you are sort of messing up with this path here. Whether you include c or not, just doesn't matter. But this theory tells you exactly what is a valid adjustment set and what not. So we, I showed you a, a, a sufficient condition, but you can also have necessary conditions. Yeah? So I, I, I'm missing the, the part where, because a, a valid adjustment set, the definition of valid adjustment set is just that the, it, it, it's different. Like the, yeah, yeah, it's, it's different, different, but, but, but it's adjustment. not so different. <laughs> so I don't do the proof here. The valid adjustment set looks like this, right? It's the same thing. So if you, it's an exercise. So you can show this is what I meant by this guy. If z is a valid adjustment set, then you obtain the causal coefficient by, this is the regression coefficient for x in a linear model where you regress y on x and z. Yep. And this needs to be proven. So if there's a then, this but is the statement. If you go back to your, the, the, the diagram, the DAG. Uh, ah, it's AC. AC. Oh, wait, 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 why is d, for instance, not a, a, a valid? And because the, you need the parents of x. If I wrote something else, then this is wrong. Go back to the definition again, then. Yeah, phew. <laughs> this is the parents of x. But, but I, I don't understand why d, d is not a valid, like given the definition. No, no, the def ah, yeah, but this, <laughs> this is a bit more tricky, right? Okay. I'm not claiming it is. I, I'm, 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 I'm telling you it is not, but it's not so clear from the definition. So there you have to work. It probably takes you seven minutes, I guess. But there, there's something to show. And this is, in general, there's a characterization of valid adjustment sets with if and only if. And it's really based on this. I think it's funny. I mean, you can, so we have uh, written a book on causality, which is uh, going to appear uh, next door at uh, MIT Press. It's already online now, so you can have a look at this. And there we are going through this, this valid adjustment set. And what you see is that it really, it only is based on this tautology on this mute, on this most useful tautology ever. This is the only thing you're only interested, you always have to see, well, which of the conditionals remains the same and which change. And then you can compute the if and only if condition for what is a valid adjustment set. And here you have to trust me that D is not. Intuitively, 
what you're doing, if you're adjusting for D, you can think of something like conditioning. And when you condition, you sort of block the path that you don't want to block. You want to block these paths. But this is, I know this is hand wavy, it's not a mathematical proof, but the proof is really based on this idea. And from a practical standpoint, if, in terms of, uh, if you measure the change in C of X, uh, adjusting for different factors, does that give you evidence of where things may lie on the pathway? So if you, can you repeat that? If you're measuring the change in C of X. Uh, like C, like the, the regression coefficient, right? Yeah. So CX to, X to Y. If you do that when you're adjusting for different factors. Ah, this is a very interesting idea. So if you want now compute the CXY, if you don't know, the, if I understand correctly, you want to say, if I don't know the causal structure, I'm computing the CXY, and then I'm doing this several times, and this may give me a hint about the structure. A very good point. I don't know. I, th I thought about this once, but I don't know about any uh, method that is exploiting this. But I think it's an interesting, uh, I more than welcome you to look at this. I think it's an interesting thing. Yeah. There's one, uh, what we are talk discussing maybe tomorrow or late uh, today, there's one method that comes close to this. It looks at these conditional dependencies. OK, so this is just the code. Now, back to one example. And this, I think, is quite nice. Think you are in 1950. Think you are working for a tobacco industry. Now, the politicians tell you, well, smoking is causing lung cancer. We have to put a, a, a tax on tobacco. So you're working for this tobacco industry. What do you say? Obviously, the first thing you say, this is rubbish. But then they ask you, what do you mean? So what do you tell the politicians? <laughs> the tax is causing lung cancer. OK. Uh, so you might get a bonus from the tobacco industry, but I think it will be a very small one. Anyone uh, like willing to get a larger bonus? Yeah. It's just correlation, so, but how do you have to explain the correlation, right? So you explain this by the hidden factor, right? So what do you think it is? What do you claim it is? Socioeconomic status. status, very good. You get a, a medium bonus. No, it's a high <laughs> bonus, but it's not the highest bonus ever. Why not? Because this, it's a good idea. So you're saying it's a socioeconomic status. But the problem is, by this idea of adjusting, Right? So imagine this is socioeconomic status, so we write the dollar here. So what you now can do is if you're interested in the causal effect from smoking to lung cancer, what do you have to do? You have to adjust by this guy, right? So we know how to do this. So we are saying, well, we get data from this causal structure. Then what we can just do is we measure the socioeconomic status, adjust for it, for example, include it in a linear model, or use this formula that I've shown you before, and what you get out is the causal effect from smoking to lung cancer. And this paper has done a lot of this stuff. So if you read this paper, then they adjust for many, many things. They adjust for uh, like age and stress factors, for sex, obviously, for like where you're coming from, and so on. They always adjust, and they always see, well, there's a causing of, uh, there's an effect from smoking to lung cancer. And there's something else in the cigarettes that is not the tobacco, and you really can't adjust for it. Uh, you know, okay, so you're saying, well, there's something else in the cigarettes. That's also a nice idea. But I mean, then the tobacco and the politicians would say, well, pff, we don't care. Then we just tax not the tobacco, but the cigarettes. Uh, but I mean, it's all good ideas. I'm just using for the idea that they used, looking for the idea that they used. So you say it's a genetic disposition of the smokers? Like yes, so there you get a very good, very high bonus. So if you're saying, and this is what they did, it's pretty clever. They said, well, this is a, this is a hidden factor, and it's a genetic, uh, um, a, a genetic factor. Because it's 1950s, there's no way of measuring this. <laughs> so you can, I mean, no, seriously. I mean, of course, from nowadays, it's, it sounds ridiculous. Because you're saying, they really claim there's one gene. And if this gene is expressed, you feel the desire for smoking. And you get like uh, lung cancer with a very large probability. <laughs> nowadays, we know that it's stupid. There's no not a single gene causing anything. But uh, like, and even like two of such very diverse things in, encoded in one gene is very unlikely. But it's 1950. And if this would be the case, what you have to do is you would need to adjust for this. And there's no way to do it. So the only valid adjustment set you find in this causal graph is to include this guy. But if this guy is not measurable, then there's no way of adjusting for it. And this is what they did. And this, these guys are pretty clever, and I'm pretty sure they got a very good bonus for this. Um, and so something that astonished me a bit, this is a book that I recommend. I enjoyed it a lot reading, Merchants of Doubt. So it turned out that these um, 
uh, these scientists that were experts on uh, lung cancer and smoking were also experts on climate change. <laughs> so they also, <laughs> they also find very good uh, ideas of uh, so, sort of claiming that either climate change does not happen or that it's not caused by humans. And this is like, um, uh, this is described in this book, Merchants of Doubt, so how you can actually try to influence the interpretation of science. I think it's, it's a nice read. To know specific genes, to, I mean, you can ask in family trees about how heritable is smoking and cancer, and at least part, partially addressed. Yes, yeah, this is what they did. They also looked at uh, different, this, I mean, it's coming close to this, they did some serious stuff, because this was a very important question, right? So they looked at, for example, populations in different countries as well, and there you can also say, if you don't have a lot of mixture, you can, if you see the same increase, like in two very different genetic population structures, after, and then you can try to argue. But it becomes messy, right? It becomes very hard. Yeah. Good. Um, there's one last thing I would like to talk about um, uh, today, or any other questions about this example? The adjusting, is this roughly clear? Good, uh, yeah. Just a comment, if I'm not mistaken. This came on the background of previous studies that showed correlation between lung cancer and soot. And like uh, in the air, I think in, in England, so there was a background unrelated to smoking that supported something like this. Yeah, also a good point. So what you are doing then is, you are, I mean, you're trying to broaden your model class, right? This is what you have to do. And we will see actually in these so-called independence or constraint-based methods that this is something useful also from a mathematical point of view. You can argue whether this is the case. Yeah. There's one more thing that I want to mention, and this is a bit maybe surprising that it only comes now because it's uh, so essential for causality. And this is the idea of uh, randomized studies. So it turned out that a couple of centuries ago, um, a scurvy was actually a big problem, and uh, I read that in the 18th century this caused more deaths of British soldiers than any, enemy, any other enemy action. So this was a big problem on the ships, and James Lind, I think he was a Scottish medical doctor, he um, uh, conducted one of the first randomized experiments. They're usually, what you often see is in these uh, randomized experiments, you see uh, uh, examples from a different field. So I have an idea what the Facebook and Google from like two centuries ago was. It was agriculture. So this is where all the statistician worked. But this is an example from the British Navy that I like. Uh, so what do you do? In a randomized experiment, and this is, I, so I, I mean, you, maybe I'm biased, but I think this is really a genius idea. What we have seen a couple of times now is we have a treatment and a recovery. And we are interested in the causal effect from the treatment to the recovery. But then you always have to adjust, right? Because you have these stupid backdrop paths. It was the size of the stone um, in the example that I showed you. In many other studies, I mean, in the, you have the chocolate, it's the same game, no? You have the chocolate and the Nobel Prize winners. The problem is you always have these hidden, latent, hidden causes. In the chocolate case, it's probably something like the economic strength of the country or something. So rich countries are probably more, spending more money on uh, research and on chocolate at the same time. But you, you always have these hidden factors and you can try to correct for them as it was done for the lung cancer study, but you, never, you can never be sure like, that there's not another one that you didn't think of that you have to correct for or adjust for. Now, what do you do in a randomized study? I think it's really genius. So what you do is you randomize food, you randomize the treatment. So you are not distributing, like you're not observing anything, but what you're saying is you're throwing some dice. And then if the outcome is one to three, you get the treatment. If it's four to six, you, do, you get a placebo or not a treatment. It turned out uh, apparently that throwing the dice is not random enough. So what they did is that the, the doctors at some point, the medical doctors had to call a number and then uh, this number, the person on the other the side of the phone, told them a random number, and then they had to take this. Because apparently what the medical doctors did for some time, they threw the dice, and if they didn't like the result, they threw it again. <laughs> which is maybe not what you want to have in a randomized study, and apparently if another person tells you the random number, that's uh, more trustable for some reason. But anyhow, how this is, I mean, any, these are implementation details, which are important, but the idea is really that you randomize the treatment. And what happens? it automatically kills all incoming errors. So then you're getting data from a causal structure where the treatment does not have any incoming errors. So this means, what is a valid adjustment set? 
Well, the parent adjustment says it's the empty set. They, we have to use the parents of f. There are no parents, or so food, or the treatment. There are no parents, so we do not have to adjust at all. So we just run a linear regression, or any model that you like, from the recovery on the treatment. And this is, I think, it's really genius, because no matter how complicated life is, if you have a way of randomizing this, then it's very easy to find the causal link. And this is what our society um, sort of makes use of nowadays. No? I mean, this is, these are the randomized studies that we're doing in the uh, medical regime, which are like used everywhere. And these are somehow, this is, seems to be something that we trust. And formulas, this is like saying this, no? I mean, the, the distribution of recovery, if we intervene now, is the same as conditioning. Usually it's not. But because there are no incoming arrows into F, this is the same thing. So this is, we can just read it off from our data. So how does it do and how does it work in practice? So in this, uh, this was one of the first studies. So James Lind, what he did is he was on one of the ships. And then um, we can read this together. So on the 20th of May in 1747, I selected 12 patients in the scurvy. So there was a scurvy outbreak on board the Salisbury at sea. Um, so what they thought is that this is something like, uh, um, you need some sort of acid to cure it. For some reason, they didn't know uh, anything better. So what they did is they uh, distributed uh, sort of different treatments. They're all related to, uh, to acid. So two were ordered each a quart of cider a day. Those were the lucky ones. Two others took 25 drops of elixic uh, vitriol. This is basically uh, sulfuric acid. So this, <laughs> these were the less lucky ones, three times a day. Two others took two spoonfuls of vinegar three times a day. Two of the first patients were put on a course of seawater. Here you see that this is actually a bad thing to do. It's not a well done randomized study because you should not look at the, whether they are bad uh, outbreaks or not. And two others had each two oranges and one lemon, given them every day. Aha! So they didn't know about the concept of vitamin C. This was not found yet, but those were the ones that got better, as you can imagine. The two remaining patients took an electory recommended by a hospital surgeon. Uh, this is some uh, weird stuff that was common <laughs> in those days. The consequence was that the most sudden and visible good effects were perceived from the use of oranges and lemons, one of those who had taken them being at the end of six days fit for duty. So it, take, it took some more time to like, really get this published and like, acknowledged and re repeated experiments, but this was one of the very first randomized experiments, and this guy had the correct idea. Any questions about this? Okay, so but is it clear how this randomized study, they fit into the picture? Important for me. Um, good, so there's one thing that is, this is only a side comment, it's also not important for the remainder of the, the mini course, but somehow this was important for me at some point, because what you're doing now so far, and hopefully it will get better in the next sessions, but so far we are somehow working only on, sort of in the math world, right? This is all mathematics. So we are defining a structural causal model, um, we are sort of defining what an intervention is, we are defining adjustment, but this is all in math. And we somehow have to link this to reality at some point. So what is the cause in reality? And I think this notion is pretty useful. So if you have causal models, you can say that two models are called either probabilistic or interventionally equivalent if in the first case they have the same, they entail the same observational distributions, or in the second one you have to agree on the observational and interventional distributions. And this is a trivial definition in a way, but for me this is really important to sort of link this to reality because it turns out that it is actually, it doesn't matter what kind of interventions you look at. It suffices if you always look at interventions. We have heard that there are many, many interventions you can do, but it suffices if you only look at the interventions where you randomize a variable xj and you put it to a fully supported noise variable. And this is the idea of a randomized treatment. So it suffices to look at interventions where you take one of the variables, like let's say the treatment, and you randomize it. So you put it to a random vari variable. Now this, I think, establishes a link to reality. Because in reality we have a model, right? So this is not different from statistics. You're writing, you're writing down a model that somewhat describes the data generating process. So let's say you're saying this is a, you're claiming this is a Gaussian distribution. Now you're receiving data, and at some point you want, according to Popper at least, you want to be able to falsify this model. So what do you do? You construct tests for this, right? So you're saying, well, I get more and more data, and then I test whether the, the data looks like it's a, if it's Gaussian or not. And if it's not, I reject my model. 
And this, I think, is very important for, uh, for science if you do it like proper uh, thought about it, at least roughly. And here you can now do the same thing. So now we are not looking at a statistical model, but we are looking at a causal model. And we should somehow be able to falsify it. Otherwise, it's a bit of a question, what are we doing? What is the game we are playing? And here you can do this because we are saying, well, a causal model you can falsify now if you look at the data generating process and if the observational distribution does not seem to come from the model, then you can reject it. That's the game we have played before as well. But now what we can also do is we can link it to interventions. So we can say, well, if it's a causal model that predicts that something happens under a randomized experiment, and I actually perform the randomized experiment, and I see the outcome is very different, the distribution of y is very different, then I would say, well, then it's probably the wrong causal model. And this link, I think, is nice that you only have to look at this randomized experiments. But this is really a link how you can falsify these causal models. I think, like, from a philosophical point of view, it's important. Yeah? Sorry, just take one step back. In the kidney study, if that was randomized properly, then we wouldn't have needed to, yeah. to adjust. Yeah, so if the kidney stones would have been a randomized st uh, study, then it could not have been that the size of the stone is causing the treatment, right? It would be completely random. And then you don't have to adjust. But in a way, it's an interesting uh, thought, no? Because if you already think that treatment A is better, it's a bit of a question whether you should randomize, right? Because if, it's there, if there's a way, it's a bit tricky, but if there's a way to say that it only depends on the size of the stone or nothing else, then we can actually adjust for this. Right? And then you save more lives at the end of the day. So you can, it's actually a trade-off during the study how much, like, how many people sort of get hurt or not. Yeah. But in, in some studies, it's very difficult to do because if you see the patient, then suddenly you would need to correct for a lot of, lot of things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in cases of randomized trials, I mean, we, we, we may, there's still sometimes adjustment there. Yes. And, and that's, but that has more to do with, like, sample size and, like, OK, so I mean, maybe two comments. So the question is, we still have adjustment in randomized trials. So one point that I don't address here, but this is of uh, utterly importance in practice, is the question of statistics, right? So you can adjust, but you have seen that the, the values that are got in the program, in the R program, they vary about two, right? So the question is, what are the correct confidence intervals there? And also, are some adjustment sets better than others? This I didn't address. The second question is, well, the randomized experiments Sometimes you still need adjustment, and the reason is that it becomes, I mean, there are some experts on this, also not far from here. So uh, Jamie Robbins, for example, is working a lot on this. The, the point is they become arbitrarily complex somehow, because often you have sequential treatments. So this is one effect. So you treat someone, you randomize, and then depending on the outcome, so maybe you, you don't see a result, or you see like uh, certain side effects, you change the treatment later on. So then in these things, you sometimes need to adjust. Another problem that turns out to be very important practice is that um, some people, if they think they got the placebo, they drop out. So they stop taking it. And this is something you need to correct for. This is also, I mean, then in practice, you get all these, these problems. So therefore, I mean, this is a simplified picture, maybe, no? <laughs> this is like a very easy case, but this is a full line of research, if you like. Yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to reflect on your last definition. I wonder, so if you have a series of interventions where I have actually played with all these variables, can I actually infer the causal graph? Um, yeah. So the question is, if you have a lot of interventions, can I infer the causal graph? The answer is yes. So the simple answer is, or the simple way to see this is, imagine you have uh, intervened on all the variables. So let's say there's an underlying causal structure that is i-cyclic. And you have, like, you have 12 variables, and you have performed 12 interventional experiments. So then you see, of course, if I intervene on uh, x5, and I see 7 and 11 change, they must be downstream. No? But if like, some others don't change, then I mean, if, if you know for every variable which is like, what other variables are downstream, then you can infer the structure. But it's, there exist much more efficient ways. And um, I may, may not be able to talk about this in this mini course, but on Friday, we'll also talk about in this uh, seminar talk, I will talk a bit about one of these methods. So. Uh, good. Uh, I've learned that one should sometimes do visual breaks. This is my visual break <laughs> uh, from Copenhagen. And uh, I think this is a very good uh, place to stop. I'm actually not sure when we reconvene, if you're interested. 2 p.m. 2 PM. OK, thanks for your attention.